I don't know how you've done all these years. Seeing all the things you've seen, doing all the things you've done. Makes you feel inhuman after a while. Captain, you do know Chief Yellow Hawk. The Army wants to be certain that the Chief gets home to Montana safely without incident. I don't have any idea what he's done. He's a butcher. And the two of you ought to get along just fine. I've killed savages, because that's my job. You have no idea what war it does to a man. I hate him. I got a war bag of reasons to hate him. This will be done, and it will be done by you. The parade's over. Put them in chains. You believe in the Lord, Joseph? Yes, I do. But he's been blind to what's going on out here for a long time. Understand this. When we lay our heads down out here, we're all prisoners. You just gotta take your dues. We both know it could just as easily be you sitting here in these chains. Sometimes I envy the finality of death, the certainty. And I have to drive those thoughts away when I'm weak. Something tells me you ain't got the nerve to fire that woman. Everybody, please put your hands together for West Duty, Rosamund Bike, and Christian Bale of the great new film, Hostiles. Thank you so much for being here, you guys. Congratulations on the film. Uh, another great film by uh, Scott Cooper, one of the best we have working right now. Uh, Christian, this is your second time out with him, right? He said that he wrote this part for you. Is that a blessing or a curse when someone hands you something that they say they wrote for you? Um, it's a bit of a, I mean, you know, there's, you feel a definite obligation, don't you? But, um, uh, but with uh, Scott, it was fantastic. So um, a very gripping tale instantly. And uh, something that I knew that we would both um, be able to get obsessed with. Because um, you've got to have that, because you're going to be working on it for months ahead of time, months during the filming. And then um, uh, for the director especially, you know, months afterwards. And uh, I knew it was just something about it. Um, I don't always like to analyse why I like something initially, because uh, 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 I like to discover it as you make it. And what was it about this that uh, obsessed you right away? Or obsessed you about this well, character, Captain you could, Walker? You could see... Um, in uh, in this character who uh, is a man of very few words but uh, um, uh, just limitless thoughts um, and uh, and it was interesting to me how uh, he he kind of was able to express himself through the people around him um, it's interesting to me in terms of American history um, it's it's very raw it's very brutal it's very violent that is American history the film is likewise um, and the reckoning of a man who is incredibly good at what he does, but only knows one thing. And he has bigotry and he has hatred and he has legitimate reasons for having so because he has friends who have um, been killed. But he's intelligent. He knows he's perpetrating a genocide as well. And so whilst that's he has... That's the one thing that he's good at. That's, the, that's one of the issues, right? Yes, he whilst he whilst he absolutely hates uh, uh, Wes Wes's character uh, Yellowhawk, um, he also does have respect for him. You know what I like about so much about with this film is it allows the characters to be human and to have multiple emotions at the same time, um, and uh, and he knows that he would behave the same way that Yellowhawk uh, does um, if he were in his shoes, and then you've got this journey, you know, which you see. I don't know if you've seen the trailer there, that he's threatened with court-martial if he does not escort Yellowhawk. And, um, but to him, there's the huge guilt of rendering his friend's deaths meaningless by, by not killing this man, really. And so it's a, it's a journey of how do you stop hatred. 
Wes, what was it like for you to uh, tell a tale of the American frontier that is kind of a revisionist, revisionist take on how uh, American history usually tells this story, and especially how movies usually tell this story? Well, we should uh, give a big shout out to revisionist, right? I mean, or, or either that or correcting the situation, right? Uh, uh, um, Correcting the revisionist history from there you the go. Past. We've been we've tried it a million times before, right? Yeah. Well, hopefully this time we'll get it right. But uh, we're we're always uh, trying to do that, right? Uh, but uh, it was good to uh, play a part of a uh, a prisoner of war, really. You know, that's something that I think that we've never really dealt with in terms of how is it that uh, we, we uh, wage warfare on groups of people and uh, then um, if it's around the world, well, we rebuild their cities and rebuild their economies and stuff. What, what did we do that, how did we go about doing that here uh, fighting Native Americans, right? We criminalized them. And actually, that's what we're doing now. Throughout uh, throughout the world, and that's uh, that's a sad thing, but uh, uh, that's just sort of kind of a reflection of uh, art imitates life, eh? Yeah, the film is imitating a certain aspect of life right now. You think? I believe it is. Yeah, I mean, it's something that has happened over and over and over again, and we somehow, for some reason, we haven't seemed to pick up on how it was that we uh, kind of made these mistakes, and we continue to do this. Uh, can't we learn anything? Jeez. I, I, I hope. It doesn't <laughs> seem like we are, but I hope so one day. Uh, Rosamund, your, your character goes through pretty unspeakable tragedy uh, at, the, at the top of the film. I don't think that's... I think it's in the trailer. I don't think I spoiled anything. Uh, what was it like getting the script and reading that, like, and that you were going to have to do this as an actress and you were going to have to sort of do these scenes? Is that something that feels like an exciting challenge to you or, or do, you, do you worry about jumping into that? Those, yeah, I mean, my, my character, I don't think it, it does happen in the first 10 minutes of the film, but, but, but she, her, her family suffers a massacre right in the opening frames of the film. I mean, it's one of the most bold openings of a movie I've seen in a long time. It's very, it's very startling, and you do wonder, reading it, where you can go from there. It's, it's a brutal, brutal murder of three small children and her husband. And, and of course... I realise very quickly that this woman is is going to be left with all that survivor's guilt and questioning of why and why is is it a punishment to be left when you've lost those you loved? Yes, it is. I mean, it's a terrible, terrible thing to bear. How do you go on? How do you go on when everything that was important to you is lost? And yet, if you're a woman of religion, if you're a woman of faith, to, to ask for death is is obviously wrong too. And yet... She wants to join them. I mean, she's got no reason to, to live. I mean, it was a very, very daunting thing to take on. Partly, well, largely because, you know, in, in, in looking for answers, I drew on many, many sources of people for whom such a tragedy was real, people who've lost multiple members of their family in one tragic accident. And, you know, their, their experiences as they're written about or talked about are so raw, I thought, well, I have to do justice to their experience, otherwise this is just a total fraud. Um, I would also imagine people who have not just lost um, family members or, or loved ones in tragedy, but those who also then had to come to a term, uh, some sort of forgiveness afterwards, forgiveness, the perp forgive the perpetrator or someone else, sort of overcome some form of hate that was instilled in them after that loss. I think that's really true. Uh, and I think, you know, that one of the things I learned playing Rosalie is that she's burnt up with a hatred which she finds overpowering, overwhelming, and yet she realizes that, that there's no answer to it. You know, if the people who killed her family die, that doesn't bring them back. And so in a way, it's a journey into an acceptance that life can go on, life will be forever changed, but there is a new life. You know, there has to be hope. Films have to deal in, in hope, I think. Ultimately, there has to be a vision where... And it's an ambivalent hope that our film puts across. I mean, even our ending, we were talking about it last night, is not you know, it's certainly not joyful. It's, it's, it's full of questions. I think Hostiles raises a lot of questions and there are questions about the future of all the people that go long beyond the end of the film. Um, I think it's hopeful though, isn't it, the ending? Uh, will this be shown before the film comes out or after? This interview? Yeah. This interview's live right now. 
Oh, is it? Yeah. Oh, hello. <laughs> oh, well, I won't, well it, I, I won't say what I was about to say then, because it would have ruined... But it will still the, be online the ending, after the film know. comes out and people can go back and watch yeah. it. All right, no, but that, I'm going to... Oh, they will. Not, Don't not, give me not, that look. Not, They'll not, watch it. <laughs> Uh, Christian, you know, oftentimes people talk about the likability of a main character in a, uh, in a lead role. And your character in this film, I, I don't know if we necessarily grow to like him or if that matters at the end of the day. It doesn't matter for me when I watch a movie. But as an actor diving into that role, how much do you consider that? Do you try to find moments to make him, quote, likable for you or for the no, audience? Um, what I do try to do is find moments that you understand. And you, you can't avoid that because uh, in any human being, there is going to be an element to them that is understandable and uh, surprising uh, uh, to yourself. Now, this is a man who, yes, is a bigot, is filled with absolute hatred, um, but he is loyal to a fault and will die um, uh, for his friends. Um, but he's very intelligent as well, and he recognizes that um, uh, uh, in spite of the pain he is going through, he is actually causing um, this pain. And it's a much larger pain of genocide, you know, enacted upon the Native Americans. Um, and and there's also, a, there's also a, a hatred and disgust at the fact that he has seen so many die. And then suddenly the political winds change. They need a PR stunt. And he suddenly has to escort this man uh, to a sacred burial ground. And just the frustration of having leaders who do not put themselves in danger at all, but mm -hmm. expect soldiers of the likes of Blocker to live and die based on their whimsical uh, decisions. And so I came to understand a great deal, um, but he is a man who has had to fill himself with very unhealthy um, uh, motivations. Um, and we see him attempting in a very difficult way to shed himself of that uh, throughout the film. And Do you, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, and, and yet, you know, when my character comes across Blocker or he comes across my character, y you know, there's an unspoken, ten I wouldn't necessarily say tenderness, but goodness that's immediately apparent. You know, there's some, he's probably not someone who's come across many women at all. I think he's probably, I think he's really fascinated with Rosalie, Rosamund's character. And he's seen, he's witnessed, Yellowhawk has a family. He has love. He has that, that unity. He doesn't have that at all. Um, uh, um, and, and Rosalie is a fascination to him because she expresses her pain. And they're both very damaged individuals. But Blocker is a leader of men. He can't show that. But to show vulnerability is to show weakness. And so he can't do it. But so he finds her fascinating in that she is expressing the way that he feels himself, but will never show to anybody. Do you find um, any similarities between uh, this story and Blocker's relationship with the Cheyenne and sort of current political things that are happening right now, especially when it comes to those that are sort of trained to fight and to hate in other countries and then the changing political winds sort of causing mm, I can't even, I can't even uh, backlash? begin to understand how... Um, our fighting men are uh, then expected to just stop when they've yeah. seen their uh, loved ones, their brothers in arms killed, um, when the, the politics change in Washington, um, uh, when they're treated very often so miserably when they do return home. Um, how they manage that is almost unfathomable uh, to me. And also, you know, something we didn't, when, when Scott first sent me the script, and I would imagine when you guys first read it as well, unless you were very prescient, um, they, they, uh, we didn't realize how relevant this would come to be. It started to be during the filming, and then became very much so after filming, when you started to see the, the, the comfort with which um, Americans were starting to express their hatred for other Americans, for other people different from them. And to start, and seeing that division becoming, becoming acceptable uh, to some people. So what was that, what's that like sort of doing a press tour for the film now as it's come out and we're in the, even further in the midst of that? I mean, I think it's a wonderful opportunity in the hope that, um, yeah, this is, this is not only just a bloody gripping tale, and, and, and one that you know, I became obsessed with and, and just loved to watch, but one that is incredibly thought-provoking um, and, and, uh, and does show we've been here before. 
division is not the way to go. Hatred of the other is not the way to go. America is built on inclusion. I'm English, as you can hear it, but you know, um, this is my adopted country. Uh, I love it to bits, and and clearly, the direction that uh, uh, we're going in right right now is a very very troubling one, um, but hopefully, good. Um, you know, will come will come out of it. And then dehumanization is a you know is a large part of our uh, story here. We're in. Uh, uh, <clears throat> he's asked to uh, have the uh, the Cheyenne all dressed up and find up with the braids and everything with the women and uh, the men as well. And then we stop and uh, Blocker actually would like to kill me at that point or, or Yellow Hawk. Uh, I think a Christian might want to kill me at times too, but uh, we'll go past that. Uh, but uh, he, yeah, I think that's the case at that, that point is that, yeah, I, I think he, here, take this knife, let's get it out, let's get it on is, is pretty much the whole thing there. And uh, he could stop the whole uh, story at that point in time, uh, which is, I think, what Blocker has in mind to do. At the, but uh, uh, no, no. Um, I think a dying man, a man who has been in prison for seven years uh, and knows that, uh, that uh, the Grim Reaper is coming in any case at any given time, uh, I don't think I'm going to speed things along here or take the chance of speeding things along here. And uh, I really don't uh, feel healthy enough to fight this man at this mm -hmm. point in time. That's why Yellow Hawk is thinking, right? But uh, like I say, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> but the, the point that he makes at that uh, juncture is that, uh, all right, uh, let's dehumanize them. Take them, uh, make them, uh, the women take out their braids and... Uh, Which is a great insult to the Cheyenne. Let's, uh, yeah, let's criminalize and dehumanize them again here as we travel on here because uh, that's just the way that uh, uh, that he sees us. And uh, as, uh, as a person of color, I, I think I've uh, lived with this uh, uh, the larger part of my life. And... Uh, the unfortunate thing now is with uh, since November, things have sort of turned back to where all of that is much more acceptable, uh, much more like, say, when I was uh, a young man. Um, but over the years, it seemed like we really made some strides in society to at least uh, hide that part of our uh, uh, personality, our societal personality. But... Uh, on the other hand, uh, things have opened up to the point that, hey, let's express these things that we uh, can feel. At least parts of society can do that. And we've made that possible somehow. It's a film where, in its heart, it's, uh, it's really about time spent with the other is much better than time spent without. It builds empathy. At, the, you know, at a certain point, we see all the things that you talked about, that he has a family and these other things. It makes... Uh, Blocker much more empathetic at a certain point towards him without giving anything away. Yeah, I, I think though that Blocker has um, uh, he, he's a he's a incredibly complex man, incredibly deep man. Um, he has an awful lot of self loathing and guilt. Um, uh, he's not going to stop what he's doing. He's a, he's a dutiful soldier, and also the hatred has become real as I described because his friends have been killed. But that's mixed in with a great deal of guilt, which I don't imagine Yellowhawk would have at all, because he is defending his way of life. He's defending his family and his community, whereas I'm attacking. And um, uh, and I think you know, I think the whole thing that, that that Wes was talking about, you know, since November, is is it's it's people try to kind of put it into a red state, blue state thing, and I think that's really the wrong. Uh, I, I, message and it's it's uh it's um i think it's really disingenuous um as well you know our culture will be so much richer the day that we stop saying hey it, it, it's all white dudes who are running things whether that be hollywood whether that be washington you know we're gonna get in hollywood so much uh, better films and so much more uh, interesting stories being told and America will become the America that the rest of the world sees it as, that makes it unique, that, um, uh, uh, that, that as an Englishman, and I'm sure Rosamond is an Englishman as well, we recognize 
I'm going to drag you into this, um, that we recognise makes this such a beautiful, brilliant country. And, uh, and not to ruin that, I mean, it's the reason that I, I moved here. It's the reason my kids have American accents. Um, it's because it is that. It's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a country of inclusion and invitation. Well, I'm glad you could come over. <laughs> Thank you, mate. <laughs> Rosamund, did you have something that you wanted to add a minute ago? I saw you start. Oh, I, was just, I was just thinking about Christian's performance in this film. There's a really amazing portrayal of soldiering. Um, and it was just as you were talking, I was remembering something you'd said to me very early on that you know, if you're surrounded by so much violence and so much um, darkness, the only way to cope with that, if that is your life, is to become it. Um, and I think Christian's performance is a really brilliant, profound understanding of that. And and as as my you know my a lot of my work in the film is observing it and see, witnessing the self-loathing that that Rosalie definitely sees in him. And, and her, I mean, one of my missions, I felt, was to try and assure Blocker that ultimately I, I think he's a good man. Thank um, you so much for saying that. And I think also, though, that it's, it's Blocker in observing Rosalie, too, in, uh, it, that informs him so much. And I think, I think across the board, you know, the, the performances, Jonathan Majors mm -hmm. uh, is incredible. You know, Timothy, Rory, uh, Jesse... I'm very happy uh, that uh, uh, Scott Cooper is Corianca. bringing back Rory Cochrane. Um, I'm really, he's, 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 he's amazing. He's, he's, he's fantastic. Um, everybody else, it, the, the, it's a superb cast, and that comes down to Scott um, uh, in doing that. He he uh, he an says himself, didn't he? He re it was a real wonderful experience. Uh, you know, it was it was tough, um, but I think we're all kind of looking for that. Um, I am anyway. Yeah. I, yeah. I want to really know that I've worked for this. I think I'm uh, lucky to be able to do this job. Curse. Oh, I can? Yeah. I just get so used to when you're on camera, you just have to go <laughs> instead of yeah. actually More saying, than welcome to um, uh, I can't even do it anymore. I just got, I've, got little, <laughs> I've, 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 I've got little kids as well, so that's the way that I tend to curse myself. Yeah. But, but you want to really work. You really want to engage um, and, and be there. And as Scott says himself, you know, he, he, he loves to take something that could be commercial and make it far less commercial yeah. um, uh, at all. But, uh, but thank God, you know, we're, we're, we're removing all of the kind of propaganda of uh, so many Westerns. And this isn't your mum and dad's uh, Western. Uh, it's far more authentic. And, um, and also, remember, you know, these, these movies, they're dying in the theatres now. Unless it's zero budget or you're playing some character like Batman... Right, <laughs> people aren't going Batman to see the really films sucks, no. at all, <laughs> and 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 we need to find a way to keep these kinds of movies um, uh, uh, thriving in, uh, in in the theaters. I think it's vital, and it'd be such a shame if uh, that was to be lost. And this is a film that sort of demands to be seen in in theaters. I mean, you say it's not your mom and dad's western, um, but I would argue the, visually it's very much your mom and dad's western in the sense it follows in the same language of John Ford. You know, it's it's yes. very wide open spaces and beautiful yes. and long held shots. Well, that's the good part. Yes, yeah. that's a, it's, it's the American best part. Of your that, that, that's Massa, the DP. He's absolutely extraordinary. He did out of the furnace as well. He, he's absolutely incredible. What's it like to be able to be a part of a film that is aesthetically like that when all, all other films sort of be, seem to be combating that and striving to get our attention this, all, like this fast all the time? We got the pace of life at that time in a really extraordinary way. I think there's, you know, we were talking earlier about the violence. You know, this is not a film that, that glorifies violence for the sake of it or makes it, you know, supposedly appetizing and exciting. I mean, it is exciting and it's brutal. I mean, the brutality in this film is, is, is extreme. Um, but um, also the the beauty of it, and it's and to be you know to be English and coming and seeing the best of America like that is pretty profound experience. It's whether film can ever you know this comes as good as I've seen to capturing what we saw before our eyes because often sometimes with film you can have spectacular vistas that somehow don't live up to it on screen, and I think in this case, Massa's photography really does. Um, uh, I'm going to go to audience questions in just a minute, but before I do, Christian, uh, I've got to ask you, you're a bit bigger than you normally are, I think because of the last movie you were making, right? Uh, do you like it? How do you like being a little bit big? <laughs> I like rolling around, you know? Um, it, it, limits, about it, it, it limits um, my uh, uh, pant choice. 
no. Yeah. Um, it's either elasticated or um, these. Like, uh, but but I'm the type of shopper that goes out and I go, oh, yeah, right, I'll have six of those, and that's the end of it because I don't like shopping. So, um, but uh, yeah, no, we just wrapped on filming uh, Cheney last week. I was completely bald, bleached eyebrows. Um, yeah, but this was really a canvas for the incredible makeup artist to create uh, Mr. Cheney uh, upon my face. Well, I got to ask, what was it like shooting that while this is ha while this is happening in this country? Uh, very interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Just en endless, endless uh, conversations, research. Um, Adam McKay, who did the Big Short, and uh, Talladega Nights, and uh, Anchorman, etc., um, was was directing, and uh, it was it was fascinating. And that'll be that'll be uh, uh, well, we can talk about that next year. Yes, absolutely. What's your process for getting back down if you if you have to do it? I've got no idea. Uh, it used to be <laughs> it used to be uh, losing weight just meant smoke a lot and drink whiskey. Uh, but I don't think I'm going to do that anymore. <laughs> All right, let's get some audience questions. I've, I've annoyed them enough. Let's get one. Uh, hi. So um, there's some horseback riding and some other uh, exterior shots. Uh, how physically challenging was it for you guys to, uh, to uh, work on the movie, and was it hard to balance that with some of the emotional aspects? Fantastic sweater. That's like Christmas Spider-Man, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, Merry Christmas. Spider-Man. Yeah, Spider <laughs> there. Well, we had horses every day. Four, how many horses did we have on set every day? I mean... Uh, at least a dozen. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Wes is a very experienced horseman. Oh, he, actually, I, a I, I was... of horses. I was playing in my backyard. You know, I, I live in the area right. where uh, we, we shot in northern New Mexico and Colorado. Uh, but uh, it was, uh, I, I think it may have been a little uh, uh, more difficult for those who weren't accustomed to 7,000 feet altitude there for, for a while, but I think they measured up uh, within a week or two, you know. <laughs> Next question. Yeah. Hey, guys, how you doing? Good, hey. thanks. Hey, Tommy. I've been watching you guys for, like, all, all my years and stuff like that, so um, I'm big fans of all you guys. Thank you. So um, I have a question for you, Christian. Uh, was it hard to get in, into Blocker's head as a, as a way of like, uh, figuring out like, what, how he's about and stuff? Um, lots of time to think about it um, previously, but uh, nothing helps more than actually getting into the environment. And so once we were out there, um, we were at you know, Fort Berenger, once we were spending hours on horseback each and every day, um, uh, you can really start to sense, only sense, but sense the isolation that the man must have felt for years and years. One more question, right here. Hi, this question is for Wes, but anybody else can answer as well. Uh, I can't believe I've got Magua 10 feet in front of me here. Um, so I'm a little bit freaked out by that, so I apologize. Um, Start moving you closer, be, very yes. slowly, and he'll get very freaked out too. <laughs> <laughs> I tend to move quickly. Uh, how do you see opportunities for Native Americans in movies and TV going to the future, especially the way the country is right now? Uh, the way the country is right now? Uh, well, uh, I, I would only hope that uh, th this film does catch on, has a wide uh, audience, and uh, uh, does well, uh, not only critically but uh, as well as box office because work usually means more work and for the uh, Native American actor more than uh, likely the the only or one of the one of the few places to get a start in show business and filmmaking is uh, the Western you know because we fit right into it right and uh, luckily over the years filmmakers have begun to use real native americans in real native american parts and uh, it uh, it makes a difference in terms of authentic authenticity and uh, it uh, gives uh, those of us involved in the business uh, a shot at uh, some work right and hopefully we'll cross over into be known as uh, to be known as actors rather than native american actors but uh, you know it's uh, it's a uh, Always a slow process. Any kind of change is always going to be kind of a l slow process in coming about. And I think that's true of all, uh, uh, true for all ethnicities within uh, the USA. 
Um, guys, congratulations on the film. It's beautiful. It's harsh. It's violent in the best possible way. Uh, an incredible piece of work. It opens December 22nd, right, in New York and L.A., and then I think it, it'll be expanding nationwide uh, following Christmas in January. Is that true? Correct. All right, guys, give them a round of applause. Thank, Thank you. you so Thank much. You.